definition of absolute power corrupts absolutely. So um, he married a woman named Catherine of Aragon, and she was the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain. These were the monarchs who gave Christopher Columbus the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria to go exploring, okay? So just to give you some context of who she is, she's the princess of Spain. Um, she was actually married to his older brother, um, and he unexpectedly died, like, a few days after they got married. So, and he was away, and it was one of those, like, you're married, but now you're apart kind of things. Um, and so this, um, this alliance was so important between um, England and Spain that they didn't want to uh, jeopardize it just because of uh, this unfortunate death. So they said, wait, wait, we have another son, right? His little brother, Henry VIII. And so Catherine was just you know, a little bit older, maybe eight or so years older than Henry VIII. Um, and so they had a very strange relationship. Um, eventually they had a daughter, Mary the First, um, and what you need to know about Catherine of Aragon is that she was very pious. Everyone loved her. She was very generous with money, kind of like Thomas Beckett. We talked about him. She went out and she ministered to the poor. She gave away money and food. And she was very, she went to church all the time. She was very, very, very Catholic, right? Um, she was also very statuesque, tall, dark, very queenly, very stately. Um, so Henry quickly got tired of her. Um, and he was known as a skirt chaser. So he basically chased every pretty girl he could find at court. And he was successful in his conquest most of the time until he ran across Anne Boleyn. Um, and she said, you know what, if you want any of me, then you're going to have to marry me. And he said, what, I'm the king. And she said, yeah, well, being a woman now isn't very easy. So only thing we have is our chastity and our reputation and so I am not just going to give that away to you. Um, and this is kind of goes in uh, with the core of the idea which I'll um, get into. Uh, basically we have this also in our culture today too where um, man, the ideal man is sort of based on this archetype um, from way back in the day where man was supposed to kind of embody God on earth and so have those traits represent God. So strong, dominant, um, fearless, a provider, this alpha male kind of stuff. Um, and this is why you see this kind of thing in our, uh, in our movies and that's that archetype. Um, there's a reason why we don't have these little scrawny uh, short guys who are um, in these leading roles, okay? Um, women also um, had an archetype. They were supposed to embody the church. So at this time, they were Catholic for the most part. And so the female archetype there is Mary. And so this is where this archetype is going to embody um, someone who is chaste, um, obedient, beautiful in terms of awe-inspiring, like on a divine level of beauty, and then also very meek, um, that kind of thing, cooperative, soft, that sort of stuff. Um, and that archetype is very much changing, but in the 50s and the 40s, and you know, that back in the day there, um, you were supposed to be quiet and clean and be subservient and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so that archetype in our pop culture is changing a little bit. Um, right, so what you need to know, Anne Boleyn here, she said, you know what, no, because I've seen how you are and what happens, and I'm not gonna be, quote, ruined, right, because of your conquest. So this fascinated Henry VIII, and he went and chased her even harder um, until finally he petitioned the Catholic Church for an annulment <coughs> from Catherine of Aragon, claiming that their marriage was never um, was already con that their marriage was invalid because it had she had she wasn't a virgin when they got married because she was married to his older brother. Um, well, she was understand so beloved in society that nobody was going to. Um, Kind of try to dishonor this for you. No one is going to try to dishonor her by even having this conversation about her. Um, and so she claimed that no, this wasn't the case because um, her his older brother died and he was sick and he was away, and so the, that marriage was never even consummated. So the Catholic Church denied uh, the annulment to Henry VIII. They said, you know, we uh, we know you. You are just trying to go and chase this other woman. We're not going to grant you this annulment. 
And so he said, I don't know if you have met me, but I am the king of England, and I am um, here, and I'm telling you, you need to do this. And the church said, I don't know if you've met us, but we're the Catholic Church, and we are the voice of God on earth. And uh, Henry said, okay, well, I'm the hand of God on earth, and I'm going to make the law. And guess what? You guys can go pack up your monasteries and your monks and your priests and get out because you are no longer going to be the official um, Christian denomination of England. And this blew up the world because Spain and France, the other two superpowers, were and Italy. Everybody was Catholic. And so when this happened in England, it created a tsunami of backlash. So um, Henry institutes the Church of England, which is Protestant. Nobody liked the Protestants back in the day, not even Henry. But he said, if I put you guys in charge, then I need you to grant me a divorce because the Catholic Church doesn't do divorce, right? And so the Church of England um, became the, the official church of that country, and the Protestants did, in fact, grant Henry the divorce. And the thing is, is that anybody who was still in charge of anything, um, or, or even secretly, did not recognize Anne Boleyn as the Queen of England when Henry moved her into the palace and kicked out Catherine of Aragon, exiled her far away, took back the crown jewels, and she really couldn't do anything about it because even though she was the queen, she was a woman. And so their daughter was also sent to the opposite side of the country. They were not allowed to um, see each other or talk to each other or write letters to each other because Henry was paranoid that they would collude against him. Um, so Catherine Aragon actually died without ever seeing her daughter again. And so if you can imagine like 12, 10 year old Mary being separated from her mom, right? And then never getting to talk to her again before she dies, right? She has a special kind of hate for her father, okay? Um, and it's extra bad when she is made the nanny of Elizabeth I, which is the child that Henry and Anne Boleyn wind up having. So I need you to let that brew in the back of your head for a little bit. Um, and then fast forward in time, Anne Boleyn um, is quickly losing favor with Henry. Um, he is again going back to his skirt chasing ways and so Jane Seymour, another pretty girl and uh, another pretty noble, so he's kind of after her now. And Anne has a problem with this. She's like, yeah, don't you remember chasing me all over this kingdom? I'm still the same person, you know, and I've got this baby to take care of and you're just out running around. And he considered this nagging, and, and he was just like, just stop. So she wound up having a boy, um, which is what everybody was hoping for, except the boy died not too long um, after he was born. So he was a child. And Henry was so sick of hearing her complaining that he accused her of adultery. And there was nothing really she could say about it. Um, and so he had her beheaded, and that silenced her, obviously. And this was not the first wife that he had executed for whatever reason. Either he claimed that they were cheating on him or they, he just got tired of them and, or they couldn't have, they didn't have a boy, right? All of these things that you hear um, are in the pot for why he wound up executing all of these wives. Um, all right, so here we have the situation now. We have um, Catherine of Aragon has died, Anne Boleyn has been executed, Baby Elizabeth the first. Elizabeth the second is currently on the English throne, right? So Elizabeth the first is, um, you know, just a child. Mary is kind of watching over her. This half, this grow, they grow up um, until Mary finally takes the throne. Now, I need you to put yourself back in Mary's place. What ne what denomination of Christianity is Mary? Would you think Catholic, Catholic right? Because um, your faith travels through the mother. And so Mary is Catholic. Is Mary a happy Catholic? No. No. Okay. And so what she does when she becomes queen, you remember when you were like in third grade and you were at summer camp or you're spending the night at your friend's house and they dared you to go to the bathroom and say Bloody Mary three times, right? Remember that, that whole challenge and you have to have the lights off and she's supposed to come out of the dark with her red eyes and kill you, right? So the reason that you still know that tale is because it has been passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation since Mary the first took the throne and 
decided she was going to cleanse England of Protestants. She hated them so much because of it, break, of them breaking up her family and Anne Boleyn and all of this. So she was reinstituting the Catholic faith in England. And so for years, the streets ran red with blood. Over 300 Protestants were executed because like most religious martyrs, they refused to give up their faith just to save their lives. Um, and so this plunged England into uh, an economic debacle, total hardship, disease, um, with all of the death going around. So it was a very dark time in England. So eventually Mary dies, right? Um, but not before she goes down in history as Bloody Mary. So all of the people in town, oh, Bloody Mary's going to come for you. Bloody Mary's going to get you. Um, and so this little childhood dare, like ring around the rosy, pockets full of posy, ashes, ashes, you all fall down. Do you remember singing that when you were a little kid? Do you know what that's from? The play. The, yes, the play. And so the ashes, ashes, you all fall down. This is about burning bodies. Um, so it's amazing all of these little childhood nursery tunes and stories and games we play that have roots in um, very violent history. Okay? All right. So here we have Elizabeth I. Mary has died. She has taken the throne. Elizabeth goes down in history with two nicknames. One is the Virgin Queen because like this, she knew very well this court of ideal. This was her society. Okay? Um, and she knew the second that she got married, her power would transfer to her husband. Right? She didn't have a father anymore, obviously. She had no brothers. Right? So she was the heir to the throne. There was no man in her immediate proximity who could make decisions for her. Um, women, even queens, did not have much power um, if they had a male relative who could make these decisions by default. So she refused to marry on these grounds. She wanted to rule her country. She wanted to rule her people. Um, and the other nickname she went down in history with is the Bastard Queen. And this is because the Catholics did not recognize her as a legitimate heir to the throne because her parents were not officially married in the Catholic Church. Okay? So you need to remember those two things because that is one of those questions on your final. If you're sleeping, you really need to start writing or, or doing so I mean, I know I want you to listen to the story, but if you're sleeping, then writing is a good alternative. Or get up and get a drink because you, you need this stuff. It's all in your chest tomorrow. Yes? So which one was the bastard queen, Mary or Elizabeth? Elizabeth. Okay. Elizabeth was the one whose mother was not acknowledged by the Catholics as a real queen. Okay, because she wasn't, she was Protestant. And um, they never recognized the divorce of uh, Catherine of Aragon. Okay? All right. Um, so Elizabeth has a really difficult time. She is not tall and dark and stately and queenly looking like Mary and like Catherine of Aragon. Right? And um, Elizabeth is a little very small woman, about yay big. She's very petite, she's got long, strawberry blonde, reddish hair, and if you know anything about um, British, Irish culture, if you have red hair, you're, you're a ginger, you're kind of, so, you're, they think you're soulless, and you're just, it, you get made fun of if you have red hair. Um, so she not only had, she also had freckles, and she had a little squeaky voice, um, and she's just very small. Um, but, she's, and so she struggled with her rule for about 10 years because she still had this um, cabinet of old bishops and these very Catholic hard-nosed um, men who absolutely thought she was a joke. And so she had to contend with them and try to rule her country all by herself because she refused to marry. It was a huge undertaking and she had a very difficult time. Um, and until Spain decided they were going to invade, because now it was ripe for the pick, England was ripe for the picking. We've got this Protestant queen in a Catholic country. She refuses to marry. We're just going to come in and take this over. So the ships from Spain are sailing across the, um, the ocean here. And there is this last stronghold of troops at Tilbury is where all of this takes place. And it's very much like Sparta where, you know, they haven't um, had any really decent food for months. They haven't been paid. Um, they're tired. Um, and their, their spirit is crushed, and now here come these ships that are gonna blow them off the map. And so they think they're gonna die until Elizabeth rides over the hillside, legend tells us, with her whole, um, her, her whole cavalry of um, royal guard, and she's wearing armor, and she has her hair all out and flowing. She really looks like an archangel that has just come out of the sky. And she gives one of these Braveheart type speeches where she rides back and forth in front of them on her horse. 
And she says, I know I have but the body of but a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and the stomach of a king and a king of England too. And this goes down and it just sh in history and it just spreads this shockwave um, of inspiration for her troops. And so they go into battle. She says, we're either going to win or we're going to be in heaven together. I'm going to be right by your side. And very few kings, let alone a queen, had the kind of guts that she did to be able to ride in at the front lines and lead like that. So they were very, very inspired. And what wound up happening was that the English Navy had already defeated the Spanish ships. And so it was, it kind of looked, it was like just this perfect storm. And it looked like God had actually decided that Elizabeth was indeed the correct ruler of England. And so from that point on, um, she took this, uh, this position here as in this courtly, she understood like, okay, if I'm ever going to manage to do this, I have to ascend to this level of devotion from these people. I have to be like Mary in the Catholic Church to rule this Catholic country. Um, so she decided she would never be married. She never had any kids. She started to wear kind of this white makeup Right, and she had costuming made where it kind of went around behind her head, so it sort of looked like a halo. And everywhere she went, she had this divine uh, presence. So she was no longer this little squeaky uh, woman, right? She was suddenly this divine being. And this is how she managed to turn the country around. Again, her um, half sister had plunged it into poverty, into disease and famine, and it was terrible. Right? And so Elizabeth comes along, and for 10 years they struggle, and then she makes this turn here, the Battle of Tilbury, and suddenly now people rally behind her. Right, England, she rules for 50 more years, and her reign goes down in history as the Golden Age because it becomes the richest country, the most profit, uh, prosperous country, the strongest military in all of English history. Okay, um, And she never did have any kids, so who succeeded her? Well, James V from Scotland came over. Um, they brought him and they called him James I. Just so you know, this part isn't on your test, but just for context so you know. Um, the Puritans went and then bothered James and said, you know, this Bible, we really gotta tighten up the reins on this. People are like dancing and partying and going out on super bottle. Like, what's going on? We gotta fix this. And so James was like, okay, you guys are so annoying, right? I'm done hearing your complaints. Just, can you just, it's just not anymore. And they got tired of it and they said, okay, fine. Um, are you gonna make the edits or not? And James said, I'll make the edits. Can you guys just get out? And so what they did is they said, you know what? There's that Mayflower over there. Let's go get on that ship and we're just gonna start over somewhere else. Forget these guys. So the Puritans got on the Mayflower and they came to the New World and they started their own um, kind of society. So yes, they did leave for religious persecution, but not because they weren't being allowed to um, not, not because it was too harsh coming from the other side, it's because they wanted it to be stricter, but they were not welcome in that respect. So that's why we have these very puritanical ideas um, as opposed to places like Europe and that are much freer with a lot of things. Um, and so then you have the, the Puritans and the battle story. Just to give you some context of where everything is, that's where the Thanksgiving and all that comes from. So, and then the edits that King James wound up making to the Bible are now still in existence today in the King James Version of the Bible. So if you go to church and you see the King James Version of the Bible, these are the edits that he made because of the Protestant or the Puritans um, constant nagging and finally said, fine, I'll make the edits, okay? All right, so pop quiz before the, you guys fall asleep too much. Um, why do we call Mary, Bloody Mary? What is that legend about? She killed, yeah, over three of the Protestants. Why, Terry? Because she, like, hated them, but she felt like they broke up the bond. Yeah, they were the ones, they were integral in her parents' separation and everything like that, okay? All right. Um, what is the courtly love ideal for women? What is their expectation? And they're, they're supposed to be in the, in the vein of who? Who particularly in the church? Mary, in the Catholic Church, okay? What was the church called that replaced the Catholic Church in England? 
And which ne which denomination was that? Yes, good. Okay, see? All right. Um, all of that said, right, we have this courtly love ideal. And again, we talked about how the ideal for man was supposed to be this image of God. So this is where we get this provider, this knightly code, all of this other kind of stuff. Um, and then women, their ideal was supposed to be kind of in the image of Mary in the Catholic Church, right? So let me introduce you to some sonneteers. Federico Petrarca was an Italian sonneteer, and he fell in love with a woman named Laura. And the problem was she was already married. And he was not going to dishonor her by pursuing her. Because again, what was a woman's only um, accolade? Was it, what was her only bargaining chip? What did she have? Her own, her chastity, her self-respect, her like, you know, purity, all of that kind of stuff. Right? So he couldn't go and taint and like um, tarnish her image by pursuing her. She was married. So this is what happened. He wound up writing all of these sonnets and all of these works um, that had these following things in common. How love itself was cruel, right? Because here he was just absolutely in love with her, but he could not talk to her. He couldn't, have, like she was untouchable, right? Um, so she's held up here on this pedestal. Um, and he had these unrealistic comparisons, right? Her, her um, eyes are like stars, her lips are rubies, her, you know, she walks like a goddess, right? All of these complete exaggerations. Um, and so it yields this internal struggle of helplessness. So again, this is why women had no power back in the day. Um, so when a man would sit, you know, even today this still works. So I can't eat, I can't sleep, you're all I can think about. This works on a dime because women are sort of indoctrinated with not having the same kind of power men do. So if they can overpower you, right, with not being able, it's interfering with your ability to eat, and like, wow, I have that effect on you. Um, this harkens back to this kind of um, power offering, right? When a man would say this to you, you felt empowered. And that's the psychology behind why that still works yet today. Much like that Bloody Mary story, it kind of takes its way, it, it sort of drifts through our history and, and remains. All right, um, and so these were, these were the things that were the, the characteristics of these sonnets. Um, that Federico Petrarca, he, he know, he's known as Petrarch, uh, would write. Um, and Edmund Spencer came after him, he sort of followed in his footsteps. They had two, uh, they had one particular style of writing. Um, they would set up eight lines and then a following six lines, right? The first eight lines in a sonnet set up the problem. This was called the octane, right? Oh, this person, I'm so in love, but they don't love me, whatever, whatever. Uh, and then the sestet, would be kind of the resolution or how they came to terms with their problem. It didn't necessarily solve the problem, but they at least figured out what they were gonna do. Even if that meant, I guess I just gotta live with it, okay? So the demarcating um, hinge here was this first line of the sestet, which is called a volte. In Italian, volte means turn or, or, or twist. Um, and this is where the, uh, the sonnet would shift Right, it would go from here's my problem, and but, and alas, or and yet, right, those words there, that's called the volte. Um, and I guess this is how I'm gonna live with it. And this was a kind of a piece of writing. So we'll get into some samples of this when we have more time. Um, and then I'll show you also how Shakespeare turns it on its ear. You'll know it's a Shakespearean sonnet because it's set up differently. Shakespeare was a little bit of a rebel back in the day. And he held up for critique, right, a lot of these social indoctrinations, like the idea of leadership and justice and duty and honor, all of that stuff he held up and he basically called hypocrisy on it and that's the essence of Hamlet and we'll talk about that when we get into Hamlet later in the week. For Taming of the Shrew, he holds up the courtly love ideal and calls hypocrisy, right? And he, he petitions for a new definition of marriage about what it really is. So all of his plays have some element of um, cracking through the facade of society. Um, so Shakespeare's sonnets look a little different. Um, differently, he has three um, sections of four lines each, which are called quatrains. And then he has a couplet, which signifies the epiphany, right, that he comes to. So again, all of these lines here represent the problem, and then he has the epiphany. Um, one of the sonnets I'll show, he, this is his most famous, I would think, my mistress eyes are nothing like the sun. Have you heard this? 
Um, coral is far more red than her lips, right? I dare, I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, walks upon the ground. So it's all this very real stuff. It says like black wires grow, if hair be wires, then black wires grow out of her head, right? So it's this very not love letter. Um, and it says her breath stinks, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, the breath that does from my mistress reeks. Well, you're like, what? Um, but it's all these very real things. And in the end, he said, um, alas, I dare say I never, um, my, I, I dare say my love would be as rare that any, that any who belied her with, without compare, something to that effect. Which basically means I'm, I love her anyway, right? I have, she has all these flaws, but I love her anyway, even more than anybody who would lie to her and tell her that her lips are like rubies and blah, blah, blah. So it's this nice little epiphany and this cool ironic twist at the end. All right, and again, the Volte comes here. Okay, so what you need to know about all this is that these are written in what's called iambic pentameter. This is also a New York text. Iambic pentameter is two syllables uh, per foot. These separations here, these lines, these are called foot. Uh, this is like one foot, two foot, three, that sort of thing. And these are two syllables of an unstressed followed by a stressed syllable. And it produces this wave rhythm. Um, and if you had me for advanced comp, you know that um, when you have words in succession, they create a rhythm. And why do we have a rhythm? A rhythm creates energy, energy creates emotion, right? So this is why this, this is the foundation of every song ever recorded, no matter what time in history. There's a variation on how fast or slow it is. Do you feel the energy shift like that, right? So this is why when you have things like, um, uh, repetition of words like parallelism. Um, John F. Kennedy's famous for this with uh, repeating different lines. It builds a momentum and so those words have the power. Like music, when you hear fast music, you have an energy rise. When you have slow music, you have an energy um, depression, right? And it's, or, or a soothing kind of thing. The same thing happens when you say um, a line in iambic pentameter, especially over and over again. So, the king has said, we all shall be repaid. Da -da, da -da, da -da. You hear that? Um, and so, it, it comes with an energy. Um, so, this unstressed signal sign here, you can see it looks almost like a flattened out U, and then if you take a foreign language, this accent mark there, that's the stress. That's where the, the hit on the word needs to be. Um, and that's what creates that wave rhythm. Um, and a lot of times, Minstrels would play, remember in, when you were a freshman you saw that scene of Romeo and Juliet where the minstrel was like ring, da 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 ring, and he'd like hit the, uh, the lute, all right? Um, that's the kind of thing because it produced this nice rhythm and it just kind of was a good background for the, for the conversations. And, um, but if you listen closely to music, you'll be able to pick out that heartbeat sound. Why do you think it's the heartbeat sound that is the foundation of all music everywhere of all time? Because that's the one sound everyone knows universally, no matter the time, no matter the language. Everyone has heard a heartbeat at some point, so it's kind of intrinsically um, already threaded into your psyche. All right, um, that's it. So let's kind of have a quick uh, rundown of um, these of all of this. So Elizabeth had a particularly difficult time at the beginning of her reign, how did she eventually overcome? The Spanish Armada. Yeah, the, what, what did she do with the Spanish Armada? It's about, well, she didn't actually do much her, herself with the Spanish Armada. Her troops took care of them, right? What did she do that sort of precluded that and set her up for success? She gave us, let me see maybe if I can find the speech. Um, I think you have time and I can show it to you. All right, while I'm looking for this, if you want to kind of jot down some of this stuff. All right, somebody get the light. Oh, they have an ad on here now. At least it's a good ad. 
return to home on digital today. All right, imagine you're up there, you've been up there for months, you think you're gonna die because now these ships are coming to blow you up. Look at these poor guys.
I have become a virgin.